we have two talks on 16th, 17th century, uh, focusing in on activity and matter um, from two different directions. Uh, the first talk is being given by Sureka Davies, who's Inter-America's fellow at the John Carter Brown Library. Um, her book, Renaissance Ethnography and the Invention of the Human New World's Maps and Monsters, published in 2016. And you see some of the monsters right there. And uh, Sureka, please. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, Itai, and Peter for bringing this event together. So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, a variety of projects and things I've been working on and thinking on. And I'm interested today in how 16th and 17th century writing and thinking about the tropics or the torrid zone in the Americas was deeply inflected by uh, a number of classical and medieval ways of thinking about matter uh, and also thinking about bodies. Early modern um, travel writing was inflected by ancient humoral and, and climatic theories and consequently undergirded by a sense of the activeness of matter in the tropics. But this activeness was not exclusively something that was intrinsically a property of matter. So what made matter active to early modern Europeans? Well, it was, it was active in a variety of ways in the context of exploration, ethnography, and natural history. In the strictest sense, this workshop might be concerned with matter that changed of its own accord, without human intervention or against human will. But early modern thinking about the activity of matter was rather more wide-ranging and nebulous. It wasn't necessarily always active or equally active. Matter might be activated by external forces, from environmental conditions to geographical location, such as latitude, to interventions by the living. Moreover, for early moderns, there was no clear distinction between the natural and the artificial, or between organic and inorganic substances, all of which could change over time at the macroscopic level. Nor was there necessarily a clear division between things made with conscious will and things or conditions that came into being due to nature. Forms of active matter include, include that which has been brought into activity through human ritual action, but also foodstuffs, medicaments, poisons, and other ingested substances which acted upon the body. So there's a, there's a sense in which active matter is also matter that uh, induces change in, in other bodies. And of course, categories aren't stable over time, nor do they move in step with words. In my talk, I'm going to come at active matter from three different routes to try and scare them or, or, or charm the sources into revealing something about how notions of active matter were shaped by travel and cultural encounters. So the rest of my talk is going to have three sections. I'll start by saying a bit about um, Renaissance interpretative frameworks for thinking about matter in space. Then I'll look at cabinets of curiosities, and finally, look at the experience of active matter during a 16th century voyage to Brazil. And one of my central arguments is that there was a problem for matter with travel. Travel activated matter in distinct and different ways. Active matter then was ontologically unstable over space and not just over time. So let me start with uh, frameworks. One type of active matter is, of course, the matter of living entities, of organic bodies, whether human, animal, or vegetal. So we might look at the frameworks that formed early modern European responses to bodies in the New World. For them, the conditions of living beings, we might also say the activity of living beings, living matter, independent of conscious thought, was inextricably linked to climate and environment. European ideas about the body originated in ancient Greece and Rome, um, 
and in the Islamic world. A theory of bodily humours underpinned several interpretative frameworks, and they offered two interconnecting approaches for explaining the disposition of bodies and the temperament of individuals. One approach was a theory of internal humours, and the other a theory of how outside influences shaped those humours. Late medieval geographers and other scholars drew on humoralism to interpret the differences among individuals in, and among groups as a combination of innate and environmental factors. Classical humorism was based on uh, the so-called Hippocratic corpus dating from the 5th century BCE to the 1st century CE and associated with uh, Hippocrates, as the early modernists will, will in the room will, will know, um, and later authors often drew on these writings. So authors of humoral works posited that all bodies were composed of a balance of four humours, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. Each humour was associated with one of four elements, air, water, earth, and fire, and was either hot, like blood and yellow bile, or cold, like phlegm and black bile. As Rebecca Earle and others have shown, these humours were associated with macro-environmental categories like the constellations and the seasons. So an environment's impact on the living beings within it went beyond the contingencies of local climate and also lay in a region's position. So humoral theory connected the nature of individual bodies, their matter, if you will, to their environment. So the extreme physical or, or behavioral variation of, of people who lived in different climates was a reasonable thing to expect when you, uh, when you traveled. From the point of view of, of, um, of active matter, conservation is uh, obviously not just thing or material specific, but also place specific. Maps were important tools with which the mutability of matter could be articulated. Um, and I'll give you a, a, you know, a couple of examples. This is a map of uh, mid 16th century Brazil produced by Norman uh, Manuscript Workshop. South is at the bottom, so you're looking at the uh, northeast coast of Brazil there. Uh, so this is a region that was, you know, being in the equator was supposed to be a region where it would be very difficult to live in a civil life, uh, live a civil life. In theory, the torrid zone was a zone in which uh, human habitation was, was pretty nearly impossible, which is not, of course, what, uh, what would be found. But the, the, the complexion of people what was there physical appearance, their personality, their mental attitude and, and character. And all of these were, were thought to ch change with latitude as well as with, with um, airs and, 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 and waters and terrain. And maps were uh, an important tool with which the mutability of living matter was articulated. And you can see how they make visible latitudinal, um, the latitudinal backdrop to humoral theory um, and kind of emblematize different regions as being in kind of nice or not so nice uh, climates. For kind of ancient ge Greek geographers and their heirs, kind of latitude then played a critical role in shaping uh, kind of living beings. This approach persisted in the Renaissance uh, among kind of geographers who rediscovered kind of Ptolemy's uh, mode of mapping using latitudinal and coordinate systems. And this system made the relationships between peoples distant from each other visible in new ways. So you could see at a glance who might live at um, uh, the relative latitudes of different regions. When combined with geohumoral ge thinking, um, a map projected using latitude and longitude made implicit claims about life and matter in different parts of the world. Um, and these are assumptions that underlay spatial thinking in a variety of geographical uh, genres. And what this might kind of offer us um, as, as we look at uh, Active matter is the reminder of the inextricability of matter from its environment. Um, 
activity is not generated independently of of uh, of that which is external to to the matter itself. So the uh, kind of second intellectual framework I want to you know, briefly uh, talk about for the activity of, of, of living bodies was the theory of monsters. Um, this is, these are kind of beings that challenged existing notions of the order of things and the types of things that existed in the world. And there were uh, three traditions for this coming out of classical antiquity, um, Aristotle's uh, generation of animals, uh, circa 350 BC, considered animals as uh, sorry, consider monsters as occasional errors in nature, uh, brought about by the a result of oops, uh, nature working. Sorry, they're, sorry, they're all going to go up. Um, we're talking in the middle. So the the example in the middle is is an occasional error in nature. You know, a, 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 you know being born kind of without uh, without a head. So anything that did not resemble its parents, particularly its father, was was monstrous. Um, a second tradition existed within a discourse of, of uh, omens and prodigies founded by Cicero's on divination in 44 BCE. And in this tradition, <coughs> monstrous births, again, matter gone wrong, um, had, had a distinct explanation, that of signs of interpending calamity. And on the far right, um, you see um, uh, uh, an iconic image from uh, the, the Reformation, and it could, every bit of this monster um, can, could be, you know, tied to some different kind of abomination in, in the Catholic Church, and that was kind of indeed how it was confused. The third tradition, uh, on the far left here, was based on Pliny the Elder's Historia Naturalis of um, circa 77 CE. So monsters were seen in this tradition as wonders of nature, things that were normal in places where the climate was distinctly different. So again, um, the kind of matter, the kind of distinct nature of matter was tied to, uh, to geography. Authors in this tradition posited that entire species of monstrous peoples uh, that might, for example, have one leg rather than two or live on an exclusive diet of smells dwelt in the far corners of the earth. Uh, Two features separated monstrous peoples um, who are entire peoples like this um, late 16th century example of any wipanoma or headless person said to live in Guyana. Um, so they were different from the one-off monsters, the accidental births or the, the, or, or the uh, omens. Um, firstly, uh, the deviations of any, a monstrous people was found across a whole population and passed down the generations. Uh, wasn't restricted to a few unnatural individuals. Second, monstrous peoples occurred at the edges of the known world. And in theory, that distinguished uh, monsters close to home, uh, from such as kind of accidental births of children with no heads because their mother was, for example, frightened during, during pregnancy, from these faraway monsters. But in practice, they often looked the same because you couldn't see what the ultimate cause was of that um, uh, different path taken uh, by matter. During the first two centuries of, of printed books, beings such as apple smellers, troglodytes, eaters of human flesh, and one-legged skiopods who had sniffed, huddled, chomped, or hopped their way across medieval manuscripts continued to pass through the hands and minds of European writers, readers, and viewers. So kind of one of the ways in which uh, early modern Europeans conceptualized the activity of matter was seeing um, living matter that took forms that were seen to be ontologically different and problematic. I want to move now to the second section on cabinets and um, kind of the... Um, assembly of distant uh, artifacts, natural, artificial, uh, human specimens even, in early modern kind of Europe. Uh, and we have a, just a few examples here. Right in the middle is a Nautilus shell cup, circa 1602, with gilded silver mounts made in Utrecht. It integrates uh, culture with nature and brings the Indian Ocean to Europe. At the top right is a feather headdress 
uh, from the 17th century from the Kalinago of Suriname, and that offered in physical form um, and also in representations a glimpse at a culture that valued human-animal relationships. Books and prints brought the world to Europe. The 17th century engraved plate on the left shows an indigenous chocolate artisan and his technologies. The detail from a map at the bottom, an early 17th century uh, Dutch map printed by the Amsterdam uh, publisher Cornelis Klaas, shows a detail from um, an illustrated world map on which the peoples of Guiana and Brazil from the tropics could be compared together from the comfort of one's own study. And on the far right, the delicate study of two Brazilian tortoises produced by Albert Eckhout, circa 1640, for Johann Mauritz, governor of the Dutch colony in Brazil. These images illuminate some of the many contact zones in early modern Europe. Sonic, visual, tactile, gustatory, and olfactory landscapes created by seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, smoking, and healing with such arts and technologies as chocolate and tobacco, chili and maize, feather work and music. Making and experiencing things like this shaped the assumptions and expectations of artists, artisans, their patrons and viewers of the potentiality of matter from and in distant regions. Of course, the whole process of getting plant, animal and, and other specimens from distant places to uh, cabinets like this involved attention to active matter in the strictest sense. Over the course of a voyage, specimens would suffer changes in humidity, temperature, and air pressure, not to mention new pests or increasingly active old ones. And so from the late 15th century, in increasing numbers of overseas artifacts found their way into European princely and scholarly collections like this, uh, called Cabinets of Curiosities, Wunderkammern, or Studioli. Here, objects were catalogued, analyzed, and displayed alongside everything from ancient Roman jewelry to blowfish. Um, this iconic room-shaped example from the mid-17th century was devised by Olaus Vorm, professor at the University of Copenhagen, teacher of Latin and Greek, and founder of Nordic archaeology. In cabinets, viewers saw in the same sweep of the gaze contemporary folk arts, ingenious machines, distant antiquities, ancient relics, and natural specimens. Cabinets are what I call epistemic installations, arrangements intended to stand in for objects in nature and even to replace them. They are also prosthetics, popular word today, um, extending the reach of their viewers, enabling them to do something that could not be done by travelers in the field. So from a cabinet, you could compare and handle uh, artifacts from distant regions. And through that flesh witnessing, if not eyewitnessing in the field, practice a form of world making, constituting new knowledge and categories, categories from a curiously global perspective. I'll give you um, one example that I look at, I'll discuss um, through its catalog. In the mid 17th century, John Tredescant the Elder and his son John the Younger, naturalists and travellers, assembled one of the earliest English cabinets of curiosities. It later formed the Colonel of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. In the catalogue's preface, Tredescant reveals that he hoped his viewers would see his catalogue and collection as tools for inventing, investigating ingenuity by means of studying rare or unusual artefacts comparatively be they wondrous plants and animals, or costumes and mechanical devices. The layout shows how Tredescant viewed the structure of the world. 14 sections, early ones have fairly straightforward titles like birds, four-footed beasts, insects, terrestrial. Um, though it's worth pointing out that uh, within the bird section is a chapter on eggs, which includes everything from crocodile eggs to ostrich eggs to um, a, given, a, a dragon's egg and Easter eggs of the patriarchs of Jerusalem. So, I mean, given the potency of, of the egg as a very kind of fundamental form of active matter, I think um, that more patriarchs' eggs is something I shall be, be looking for. 
Slowly, however, um, the structure breaks down over the course of the title page, and you have longer and longer titles. And I'll read some of them. Outlandish fruits from both the Indies with seeds, gums, roots, woods, and diverse in ingredients medicinal and for the art of dying. And so we might start thinking about the extent to which um, early modern collectors had a sense of uh, the potency of different substances that they were collecting. I mean, medicines and, of course, dyes uh, start making you think about that straight away. Uh, mechanics, choice pieces of carvings, turnings, paintings. And I want to focus on um, the subsection called um, kind of mechanic artificial works in carvings, turnings, sewings, and paintings. And this um, integrates artifacts from around the world that we might anachronistically separate into human-made and natural artifacts. So we have here some kind of objects that have been formed, so matter has, has changed, but not due to human intervention. We have the top there, red, red arrow, diverse sorts of coral, one with moss in it. Uh, okay, coral reefs may have been altered by divers and, and fishermen, but here we, you know, are kind of led to think about the activity of, of, of the coral and the moss independently of, of human intervention. This section on mechanic artificial works erases the distinction between art in the narrow sense of representational works made by people and the works of nature. I mean, it in also includes landscapes uh, naturally wrought in stones. There is a bird, uh, second red line, a bird uh, sitting on a perch natural alongside diverse sorts of ambers with flies and spiders natural. So for Tredescant, the divine and human work that made the stuffed bird was somehow analogous to that of God and nature trapping insects in amber or in the entangled relationship between coral and moss. Such arrangements challenge the notion of art as something exclusively made by people and between later 19th century categories of ethnographic objects versus European artifacts. The um, fourth chapter for rarities um, was a space where you might say, right, challenging objects were, were brought together or, or, or ones that they had put together once a collector um, was utterly confused about what to do. And, but, you know, I'm struck by how ingested substances sometimes appear here rather than alongside foods or medicines. And we see kind of halfway down uh, a bundle of Amazonian tobacco. And it's under rarities alongside various artifacts uh, that are considered as idols. Um, the idol of Osiris, Indian power god. Elsewhere, uh, towards the top, you'll see an Indian fiddle and a Spanish timbrel. So you've got a variety of uh, artifacts that were used uh, in, in, in ritual practices. So where else might tobacco have gone? Well, under plants, perhaps, or Tredescant has a things medicinal section. But placing it with rarities alongside idols emphasized tobacco strangeness. It underplayed its medical and technological dimensions and suggested instead that it was idolatrous and diabolical. So we might look at the classification of artifacts to determine whether they were being conceptualized as uh, active matter. I want to now uh, move briefly to look at uh, the 16th century French Calvinist Jean de Lery. I'll actually take you back to uh, this, whoops. Um, Lery was part of a mid 16th century expedition to set up a French colony in Brazil. It went horribly wrong when the Catholics or the Huguenots fought each other. Um, and a number of the Huguenots, including uh, Lery, uh, ran off and lived amicably with the Tupinamba uh, people of southeastern uh, kind of Brazil. Uh, Twenty years later, in 1578, Lery published his, you know, Histoire d'un voyage fait en, en la terre du Brésil. And I want to give you just a sense of the kinds of themes in Lery's history with which we can get a sense of um, the kind of variety of senses of active matter that 
peer at us through terms that we may not otherwise can notice as having anything to do with active matter. Airs, waters, places, monsters, fertility, preservation, decay, ingested substances, monstrosity. So those are the sorts of, of themes that run through this text and um, give you a sense of how Fleury geography, for example, was an activating principle. Um, the tropics up to the Tropic of Capricorn, his voyage um, has a meaningful frame around kind of reaching that boundary. During, uh, during the voyage uh, to Brazil, the crew experienced kind of all manner of, kind of problematic um, encounters with, with the environment, uh, burning rain, worms in their ship biscuit. We learn how much place shaped water for example, by the time they got to Brazil, uh, we learned that the temperature of that country, the beautiful, clear, freshwater springs and the rivers are so good that you can drink from them all you like without suffering any ill, Ill effect. So kind of Lerry there is kind of trying to kind of glean perhaps, you know, what sorts of uh, substances he can safely ingest and trying also to find some kind of pattern that relates to that geographical latitudinal uh, paradigm. Um, where monstrosity is concerned, Larry uses, uh, for example, the term whales and sea monsters interchangeably. Uh, the word monster signifies that whales have in some way transgressed the normal categories of thing. Uh, perhaps it was their size that was the, the problem. Um, there are, you know, clear issues of preservation and decay uh, on the route back uh, to France. The bread and biscuit had more worms and rat droppings than bread or biscuit. Uh, sailors were reduced to attempting to eat shoe leather and hoping that it was actually active nutritional matter. The psychological state of starvation seemed to bring about a heightened sensibility to the necessity of certain types of active matter to sustain bodies. So to conclude briefly, um, notions of active matter were not simply about matter changing, but also about how matter changed other matter. Um, you couldn't seem to separate active matter from climate in, in the early modern period. But it was not straightforward to how to read those interconnections. I mean, the tropics were supposed to be nasty, but there was also uh, the, the abundance of fertility could be seen as a threat or as, as, as a benefit. And the problem with indigenous food or medicine was essentially also one of interconnection that between mind and body. If you ate the food of an idolater uh, and, and lived under the same constellations, might you also uh, become an idolater? How could you preserve active matter from turning into things you didn't want? you might attempt to replicate the sort of environment in which it could be held in, in, in um, a helpful status, stasis. So you might eat old world foods in the new world. And just to end, something that, um, I mean, this kind of workshop is predicated on this kind of uh, active matter being a new way of, of, uh, of thinking about conservation and something of a break from the way modern ontologies have, Western ontologies have, have functioned. But I do feel as if active matter never actually disappeared in the world of artisanal craft work. You know, if you make sourdough, if you make pastry, uh, there is a very much uh, a, a relationship between the, the artisan and the material and, and a real sense of the material having agency. Um, similarly with metal work and of course, uh, music making. So I can wonder whether there's a lot more kind of active matter ontologies in the present, just not again in the places where we're used to looking. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Daniel Garber, who's the A. Watson Armour III, University Professor of Philosophy at Princeton. He's been at Princeton since 2002. Um, and uh, we met at Chicago uh, many, many years ago, and it's a pleasure to see you again here. Great. Well, thank you very, very much for, uh, for having me here, Peter. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not sure. How does this thing work? Um, 
this is up to the bank at this point. We don't have to watch that. Okay. Um, let me just make one brief comment before before I begin um, about matter. Um, going, I'm going to talk as a historian of philosophy and a historian of science about theories of matter, both active and inactive. Um, but I think we, I need to make just one brief qualification or clarification. Um, relating back to some of the talks earlier this morning, um, where matter was characterized as pure potentiality, that is certainly true in um, orthodox Aristotelian um, uh, natural philosophy. But um, that is for primary matter. What I'm going to be talking about is 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 closer to um, uh, what it is that was characterized as secondary matter, which is to say matter with form, which is matter in sort of the ordinary sense that we're using it and matter in the sense in which the debate between active and inactive or inert matter um, is, um, um, is at issue. Um, and I'm going to begin by talking about um, the villain in the story of active matter that has been uh, that is being rewritten now, late 20th, early uh, 21st century, um, which is to say Descartes. Um, the 17th century was in many ways the century of Descartes. And for Descartes, bodies in the material world um, were the objects of geometry made real. Uh, and as a consequence, were completely inert. There was nothing in body except their geometrical properties. Other contemporaries, like Hobbes, for example, largely share this view, um, which reverberated through the 17th century in many other figures, including Cartesians like Clauberg, Cordemois, Rouault, and through Boyle to Locke as well. Um, through this inert and lifeless conception of body was very influential in the century. It was perhaps the dominant trend a number of contemporaries reacted against it by positing a world of animate matter. And in my talk this afternoon, I'd like to examine briefly three different such philosophers and their philosophies. Um, Henry Moore, Margaret Cavendish, and uh, Wilhelm Gottfried von Leibniz. So let me begin with a few words about Descartes. Um, though Descartes is known best to undergraduates, um, in as the philosopher of the self, the philosopher who began his philosophy with cogito ergo sum. Uh, Descartes was better known among his contemporaries as the philosopher who rid the world of the Aristotelian baggage of forms, qualities, and vital souls. Um, while he did, of course, argue for the existence of a non-extended and incorporeal soul, its function was strictly limited to thought. For Descartes, everything else was explicable in terms of size, shape, and motion of the tiny bodies, corpuscles, that made up the material world, acting in accordance with strict mechanistic laws of motion. Most strikingly, this mechanistic model held for the vital functions of all living things, including human beings, um, um, and in a sense, for Descartes, um, even living things were lifeless. There was no special principle of life for Descartes. It was just a matter of mechanical organization. The Cartesian soul, unlike Aristotle's, accounted for thought alone. All other vital functions, um, including respiration, digestion, growth, and reproduction, were explicable entirely in a mechanical way. Um, connected with these with this mechanical program was an extremely austere conception of body. According to Descartes, the only property that bodies really have were their geometrical properties, their three geometrical dimensions. In particular, all Cartesian bodies lack any sort of internal activity or force. Left to themselves, they are completely dead and inert. But of course, they aren't entirely left to themselves. Um, the world of bodies was created by God and, according to Descartes, endowed from the beginning with motion. 
Uh, Descartes here, by the way, means locomotion. That is to say, roughly change of place. God's continual preservation of motion in the world in accordance with his constancy and immutability guarantees the continued existence of motion in the world. And so Descartes um, posited a, um, um, a fundamental conservation law. I won't read all of the quotations just for time, but he, he posited a fundamental conservation law. And in fact, this was the first conservation law in modern physics. And uh, it became the basis of all other laws that he introduced, including a version of what was later called the principle of inertia, as well as a hopelessly inadequate um, law of collision. But this, the basic idea is God preserves motion in the world um, by his constancy uh, from moment to moment. And as a result of that, there is this certain quantity, which Descartes calls quantity of motion, um, that is preserved in the world. And that's the basis of his physics, the, the fundamental law. Um, while Cartesian bodies are inert, God gives them force and activity and ensures that they satisfy determinate laws. Most of Descartes' followers followed his lead in placing the activity of all the material world in God. The position that evolved out of Descartes' original metaphysical physics was what was called occasionalism. According to occasionalism, the only genuinely active and efficacious cause in nature is God, whose activity underlies the motion of bodies and their laws, as well as the interaction of minds and bodies. And indeed, one zealous follower, Nicholas Malbranche, took the view to the extreme by holding that God is the ultimate cause even of the activity in minds. Um, Cartesianism, in one form or another, was a very influential trend in the later 17th century in natural philosophy, including the paradigm of mechanistic explanation, the conception of body as inert, and the appeal to the laws of nature. But even so, there were interesting dissenters. And I'd like to spend the rest of my talk talking about some of these dissenters. Um, a very interesting critic of Descartes was Henry Moore, a younger contemporary. Moore, who spent most of his life in Cambridge, first as a student and then as a fellow, is one of the central figures of the so-called Cambridge Platonists. As a young man in 1648 and 1649, he corresponded with Descartes, in fact, just the year before Descartes died. Initially, Moore was very sympathetic with Descartes and his views in natural philosophy. Um, but later, roughly a decade after his correspondence with Descartes, Moore turned away from his earlier infatuation and came to see the shortcomings of Descartes' mechanical world. Um, in a way, Moore never completely broke with Descartes. He always believed um, that Descartes' physics had its proper place and was able to deal with at least certain phenomena in the world. But he came to the view that the mechanical physics was very limited and incapable of explaining a great deal of the phenomena of the world. Um, like Descartes, Moore recognized souls in humans, though unlike Descartes, he thought that they were extended and exist in sentient animals as well. Descartes thought that animals were actually little machines or big machines, depending upon the animal. Um, and within the domain where Descartes' mechanical philosophy holds, Moore seemed to think that this mechanical explanation holds. So far as I know, um, um, within the domain of the mechanical, Moore accepted the Cartesian laws of, of nature and probably also believed, as Descartes did, that the laws of nature are grounded in God's activity in the world. However, Moore also believed that there are many phenomena in the world that cannot be explained through Cartesian physics. Uh, for explaining these phenomena, Moore argued for the existence of what he called the spirit of nature. And this is what it is that he um, defines as the spirit of nature. And I will read this one. The spirit of nature, therefore, according to that notion I have of it, is a substance incorporeal but without sense and adamant version uh, pervading the whole matter of the universe and exercising 
a plastical power therein, according to the sundry predispositions and occasions in the part it works upon, raising such phenomena in the world by directing the parts of matter and their motion as cannot be resolved into mere mechanical powers. Um, why do we need such a principle in the world? Well, let me give an example of the kind of argument that Moore offered. He actually offered tens of examples of, of, of this sort. Um, and here I want to bring up another, uh, once again, the issue of the magnet, the lodestone, that we talked a little bit about this morning as an object um, um, that was very much part of the uh, magician's repertoire. Uh, Descartes attempted to give a purely mechanical explanation of it, um, and I won't go through the um, I won't go through the details of it. But the idea is that the, you can see it there. These are little screw-shaped particles. This is a lodestone, or it could be the Earth, which was also a lodestone for Descartes. And there are groove-shaped particles, a groove-shaped uh, pores in the Earth or in the lodestone, and those screw-shaped particles can go in one direction but not in the other because of the orientation of the screws. And, and so when they interact with other bodies who also have pores, in some of those cases, they can go into the pores and there you have attraction. In other cases, they, they cannot go into the pores and there you have um, repulsion. And this is supposed to be, um, um, this is supposed to be an explanation or how a, a purely mechanical explanation in terms of size, shape, and motion of smaller bodies for how it is that the magnet works. Um, Moore argued on purely Cartesian mechanical terms, this could not possibly work. And he's evidently correct. I mean, this is a crazy, a crazy um, 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 kind of explanation. And this is Moore's... Um, dismissal of Descartes um, and his account of the magnet, his mechanical account of magnet. But Moore's conclusion is, if we can't explain it mechanically, then we have got to go to um, an explanation in terms of an immaterial, non-mechanical spirit of nature. Uh, from the inadequacy of the Cartesian explanation of magnetism, Moore went directly to the claim that we need to posit something beyond the mechanical never occurred to Moore that there might be a different physical explanation of it. He goes directly to the spirit of nature. Um, and in this way, the limits of Cartesian mechanism, and goodness knows there were many limitations on Cartesian mechanism, uh, led directly to the positing of an incorporeal active cause beyond mechanical nature. Moore claimed that we need a spirit of nature to explain a wide variety of other phenomena in the world as well, including gravitation, keeping the water in the moon, assumption that there is water in the moon, of course, um, the spherical shape of the sun, which on Descartes' um, account of um, the cosmos was um, um, not possible, um, as well as the development of plants and animals. And um, this is, again, I won't read this, but this is a description of some of the things that Moore thought that um, uh, we needed the spirit of nature to, um, to explain. Moore's spirit of nature is busy in hundreds of ways, shaping the world around us in ways that could not happen if Cartesian mechanism were all we had. And as Moore puts it, quote, it is the great quartermaster of divine providence. Uh, it is the mechanism by which God actually carries out his, his goals. Um, but one might ask the question, why does God need a quartermaster? Why doesn't he do it directly by himself? Omnipotence has its privileges, after all. Um, that's to say, why does Moore prefer his solution over that of the occasionalists, you know, for whom all activity in the world was, um, 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 was from God directly? Um, of course, Moore acknowledges God could do all of the things um, that, that he attributes to the spirit of nature. 
but he suggests it would be beneath his dignity. Considering the possibility that God might account for gravitation directly, he wrote, how unworthy it would be for himself, that's to say for God, to be involved in sinking and suffocating the tender offspring of cats and dogs, nay, even innocent men in the shipwreck, or breaking the heads of men, walking on the streets and perhaps um, looking with a devout mind for a temple through the, through the hurling of loose tiles. Um, and in this way, Moore argues that we need to introduce an active principle into nature other than God, something, something that will do sort of the nasty business that needs to get done that we don't want to attribute directly to God. Now, Henry Moore saw the necessity of introducing an active principle into nature, but his natural philosophy maintained a radical distinction between matter as such, which as in Descartes, seems to be lifeless and inert, and spirit, which is active. Uh, what he does is he adds a special spirit that isn't God to introduce activity into the world. Uh, another contemporary took a very different approach. Um, Margaret Cavendish placed activity in matter itself. Um, Mar Margaret Cavendish, born Margaret Lucas, was married to William Cavendish, Duke of Newcastle, and brother to Charles Cavendish, an important mathematician. William and Charles were at the center of a circle of thinkers, the so-called Cavendish Circle, which included luminaries like Hobbes, Sir Kenelm Digby, René Descartes, Pierre Gassendi, Marin Mersenne, and various others as well. This was in Paris in the um, 1640s, 1650s, when uh, the Cavendishes as royalists were in exile from the, um, um, from the English Civil War. Unfortunately, though, as a woman, she did not have a formal education and could not speak or read any language other than English. And for that reason, um, she could not access much of the philosophical and scientific literature of her contemporaries, nor could she participate in learned conversations. She knew of Hobbes. She knew of Descartes, in part because people translated it for her. Um, she knew of Henry Moore, who wrote in English. Um, I think that she was very much influenced by Francis Bacon, much of which was in Latin, but much of which was also available in English. Um, but um, this is also reflected in her somewhat idiosyncratic philosophical vocabulary, which she apologizes profusely about. But nevertheless, um, she made herself acquainted with some significant number of uh, the new ideas around her and wrote a number of philosophical books that are actually extremely interesting, as well as a very significant body of literature, poetry, drama, um, and the like. And is a figure of you know, genuine, genuine intellectual interest. Uh, now, Cavendish was an unabashed materialist. Uh, and a pa in a passage that... Um, um, that echoes Thomas Hobbes. She wrote, nature is material or corporeal, and so are all her creatures. And whatever is not material is no part of nature. Neither does it belong any ways to nature. Wherefore, all that is called immaterial is a natural nothing. And an immaterial natural substance, in my opinion, is nonsense. Um, and in this respect, she was quite distant from Henry Moore, and his spirit of nature. But it's very important for Moore to argue that there are immaterial things in nature. Um, but she was just as far from Descartes as well. Though all is material, her conception of the material was radically different than, than Descartes and the Cartesians. It was genuinely active. Um, at the basis of her natural philosophy was bare matter, what she calls only matter, which for her is a technical term. For Cavendish, there is only one kind of only matter, but even so, it involved two constituents. Um, only matter is partly animate and partly in not animate. Okay, Animate matter, in turn, is of two sorts, sensitive animate matter uh, and rational animate matter. 
Um, it is from animate matter that motion derives. And I quote, if only one, if, if part of only matter were not animate, there would be no motion. All of this stuff, by the way, is completely mixed up. Matter is, these are constituents of matter as such and, and not really sort of things that exist separately from one another. Um, and so she wrote, the animate part of only matter is the life and soul of only matter. And the unanimate part of only matter is that part of matter as is the body of only matter. Thus there is infinite li life, soul, and body in infinite matter. Um, while all is matter, uh, some constituents of the matter uh, function as soul and some function as body. But as I said, they're all mixed up together. Of animate matter, sensitive animate matter functions as the vital soul, and rational animate matter functions as the rational soul. But matter as such is animate. Matter is one important feature of the material world for Cavendish, and the other is motion. Motion is caused by animate matter. Um, animate matter is the cause of motion, for where there are no such matter, there would not be any motion. For motion is but the effect not the cause either of sensitive um, or rational animate matter. But just as Cavendish rejected Descartes' conception of matter, she also rejected the concept, his conception of motion. For Descartes, as I mentioned before, all motion is local motion, change of place, but not so for Cavendish. Um, as for the ground or principal motions, they are six. Attraction, contraction, retention, digestion, dilation, and expulsion. Attraction draws parts, contraction knits parts, etc., etc. These are the basic. You can think of these actually not as, um, they're definitely not local motions. You can perhaps better think of them as appetites of matter. This, these, are, the, these are the things that sort of move and change. Uh, these are the appetites that infuse matter. Uh, in different ways, in different proportions, in different bits of matter. Um, one can legitimately say that for Cavendish, as for Descartes and for Hobbes, all of physics is matter and motion. But both matter and motion were radically different from that of her mechanist contemporaries. Cavendish's world was not the orderly world of geometrical bodies, covered by laws of nature. Rather, it was a world of competing appetites, struggling against one another. A kind of Hobbesian war of all against all played out at the material level, through, uh, though at the level of the totality of matter, what she calls infinite matter. It is, all is, in a sense, calm. She wrote, and this is a remarkable passage, motion does make war and oftentimes opposes itself in several figures or creatures, which self-motion creates. For though the infinite and eternal matter, that's to say the totality of matter, um, is eternally in peace, not being subject to change, yet motion and figure being subject to change strives for superiority, which superiority cannot be an infinite, which causes an eternal war or at least disputes. But Margaret Cavendish was by no means the last to advance such a view of active and vital matter. The last figure I want to talk about, in turn, is Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, in whose natural philosophy the Cartesian and animist anti-Cartesian elements come together in a very interesting way. From early in his career, Leibniz held, with Descartes and numerous of his contemporaries, that the world was mechanical and that everything in the material world can be explained entirely in terms of size, shape, and motion. But his particular statement of the credo had interesting qualifications. And this is, this is from, I mean, there are many, many passages, but this is from a, a letter to the philosopher and um, theologian uh, Antoine Arnaud uh, from 1686. And he wrote, he wrote, all the phenomena of bodies can be explained mechanically. That is, by the corpuscular philosophy following certain principles of mechanics posited without troubling oneself over whether there are souls or not. 
But in the final analysis of the principles of physics and even of mechanics, we find that these principles cannot be explained by the modifications of extension alone, and that the nature of force always all, uh, already requires something else. The reference to force here is very significant. At the time that he wrote this letter, Leibniz was in the midst of a kind of anti-Cartesian scientific revolution, the invention of a science of force, what he called dynamics. And in fact, Leibniz was the inventor of the term dynamics. What started this revolution was the realization that in nature, not only was motion conserved, as Descartes held in a passage that I, I um, discussed earlier, but also another physical magnitude, that's to say the ability to do work, um, which is what he called force. And so, for example, when a body falls a certain distance, um, gaining a certain velocity, it also gains the ability to raise itself to the height from which it originally fell. Think here of a pendulum uh, when you let it go, which raises itself uh, to the height from which it originally fell. Um, when he analyzed this situation carefully, he came to the conclusion that we must posit two kinds of force in bodies, an active force associated with motion that enables the body in motion to accomplish an effect, to do work, such as raising itself, and a passive force in bodies, something that resists the acquisition of new motion. If there were no force of resistance, then in collision, one body would simply impose its motion um, on a body at rest, thereby increasing its ability to do work in the world and violating the new conservation of ability to do work, the law that Leibniz had advanced. Um, so much for the physics. But Leibniz argued the new physics of force has consequences for the metaphysics of body. If bodies are the inert geometrical objects of the Cartesian world, there is no place to put the forces that Leibniz's new physics requires. And in this way, he reasoned, uh, reform of physics requires a form of the metaphysics of body. This is what he wrote in a sketch for a book on the new science of force and body that he outlined shortly after beginning his new dynamics project. Ma mathematical science provides magnitude, figure, situation, and their variations. But metaphysics provides existence, duration, action, and passion, force of acting, and the end of action, or the perception of the agent. Hence, I believe that there is in every body a kind of sense and appetite. In every body, there is a soul. How many? Okay, I can do it. Um, for Leibniz, putting force into body meant animating it, replacing the dead geometrical bodies of the Cartesian project with matter that was genuinely alive. Not just active, but alive. There is life in every body. It was a soul that would be the source of the activity necessary to ground the true laws of motion that govern force. And Leibniz continues, and this is still further on this passage. But on the other hand, I think uh, that when once we have demonstrated the general mechanical laws from the wisdom of God and the nature of the soul, then it is as improper to revert to the soul or to the substantial forms everywhere in explaining this particular phenomenon of nature as it is to refer everything to the absolute will of God. That is to say, even though the material world is filled with thought and perception, force and activity, the entire material world is filled with living, active matter. It is at the same time governed by the strict laws of the mechanical philosophy, just as if Descartes were right. For Leibniz, then, everything is explicable in terms of size, shape, and motion. From this perspective, it may seem as if the Cartesians won the battle um, and their mechanistic universe prevailed. But hidden behind the mechanism 
in the deepest metaphysical recesses of Leibniz's system um, is hidden the jumbled animistic world of Moore's spirit of nature and Cavendish's war of competing appetites. And this is the best image that I could find for active matter. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. We now have some time for questions from the floor. Yes. Um, may I ask a question to Professor Garber? Uh, thank you for, for your presentation. When Henry Moore uh, addresses the magnet, does a quote William Gilbert's uh, vitalistic explanation? Um, I don't think so. I mean, the the arguments, the, the way the arguments generally go is, okay, here's a phenomena, and, you know, the magnet, or gravitation, or, you know, the development of the fetus, or whatever. Uh, and he gives a Cartesian explanation um, a go, or goes through Descartes' explanation, shows why it is that that's false, period. Conclusion, spirit of nature. So he doesn't, he doesn't consider alternative explanations. Everybody knew Gilbert. I mean, the, the work was, um, uh, was widely, um, uh, widely read, including De Magneta as well as the De Mundo had been published by that time. But um, it was mainly, I think, Gilbert's experiments that people that people were um, 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 focusing on at that point, and not so much his own explanations. This is just a scientific curiosity here. Did the card draw draw is a picture of the vortex by looking at uh, iron filings. I'm sure he magnet. did. <laughs> because it's, I mean, to me, actually, the theory of the, the spiraling forces in the vortex, it's just so beautiful. It does look like actually a modern explanation. I'm even thinking. <laughs> well, nobody nobody in the modern explanation would appeal to group particles. I know, but it's so beautiful. I mean, you know that yeah. something else which is very important in chemistry and really in, in biology is the fact that it's the handedness of uh, organic molecule that actually are living material. Yeah. So this, this idea of things that, uh, that are polarized is extremely important. And, and if you think about it, the great mystery in modern science or electromagnetic science is that the magnetic monopole has not been identified, right? You know, we know a particle that's charge plus, a particle that's charge minus, but there's no such thing as a little ball charge N and a little ball charge S. Right. right. Um, Descartes, Descartes um, may well have actually played with magnets, or lodestones at least. Um, he certainly read Gilbert, and he is certainly borrowing from, from some of Gilbert's um, um, uh, diagrams. And, um, but, you know, and the iron filings are, I think, you know, in, in Gilbert. And, uh, um, but still, I think that Moore is right. It doesn't work. Um, I'm not sure that that's much of an argument for a spirit of nature, but even so. <coughs> Yeah. Yes, uh, I got a question for Sirica. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the treatises, also the Dutch treatises, and, um, and also uh, Van Eekhout, that you show <coughs> as, as somebody who is uh, uh, looking, actually really looking very well at what happened in Brazil, or actually in the Caribbean at the time, uh, like Frans Post as well, who did that. So, uh, in regard to the, the display of how they were th thinking of the inlanders uh, at the time. And, and, and at the same time, the way that they've been painting and actually really <coughs> making scenes and giving accurate, uh, well, presentations of, of what they came across. How do you see the relation between uh, those two different aspects within uh, the people visiting there and actually looking from the West into the Caribbean as to where they visited? <coughs> um, are you asking about the relation between people 
painting and representing on the one hand, and then people assembling artifacts? Assembling on well, also with the assembling of artifacts, that was, of course, with the Netherlands in the 17th century, that, that happened a lot because uh, with all the trade that took place from, from 1600 onwards, uh, this is something uh, uh, like Rembrandt, you know, he had his whole uh, rooms of oh, curiosities right, yeah. and, and, and doing that. But no, also to, uh, w when you showed that picture of, of uh, the beheaded man and then uh, mm -hmm. there was a Dutch uh, text with it, I don't know uh, from which book that came. Uh, uh, that was a 17th century French text, a chocolate artisan was a uh, French text. Uh, the oh, the, the first one. Class, uh, the headless man. And it was Cornelis Klaas. Cornelis Klaas, it was yeah. from a detail from a map, yes, so with the headless man and the two other figures. Because what strikes me is that they look at the inlanders like that, but at the same time they paint uh, what they see. And right. what they see is accurate. And is ah. Right. Oh, I see. So you're interested in, in almost the, the seeming disjunction between headless figures, representations of headless figures, and then the representations made by someone who traveled, like Franz Post exactly. or like how. Um, the, in the case of the, uh, the map, the class map with headless figure and two cannibal figures, uh, the other place that uh, the kind of Dutch uh, printers and map makers got information was from travel writing itself. So the headless figure was described by Walter Raleigh in his description of Guiana. Mm. Uh, so as far as the map makers were concerned, when the Dutch map makers put information about New World peoples on maps, they were drawing very carefully on travel texts. <coughs> so then the question is, so why did Raleigh talk about the headless people in Guiana? Um, ethno historians have uh, demonstrated that their were uh, accounts among indigenous peoples of distant peoples with different bodily characteristics. So Raleigh uh, most probably heard accounts of people with, with, with no heads, uh, women who lived in tribes separate from men for most of the year and so on. So there's an ethno-historical basis for why Raleigh chose to talk about headless people and Amazons. Um, and of course, this is the tropics, so it's perfectly reasonable to expect minds and bodies to be different. Um, that's no different from astrobiologists today uh, looking at um, deep sea volcanoes, for example, to look at how what life looks like at the edges of life on Earth under extreme pressure, under extreme heat, to then decide where to turn their telescopes um, in outer space, you know, what kinds of other places might we see life. And, we don't expect life in other galaxies to look like life on Earth because it's a different climate. If I could just jump in there, um, this last idea about the value of looking at the extremes and move you a little bit from the monstrous uh, to monsters, which could be found in Europe and the old world as well as in the new, and wondering about the category of the monster from the perspective that we're talking about, that animated or uh, non-animated matter, and I was thinking actually of the Golem of Prague as the paradigm for this, right, because it's just a lump of clay, it's pure inanimate matter, until the divine name on a piece of paper is inserted into its mouth, and then, and then what is it? So could you, could you talk about monsters from this perspective? Was it monsters as a, monster as a subjective? category that changes? <coughs> or no, no. Money. Monsters as matter. Monsters as matter. Um, individual monsters. monsters in Europe were typically seen as beings whose matter had gone wrong. Uh, so the, in the process of generation, um, the kind of natural course of matter has been altered. And the reasons for them could be various. So um, one reason given for why uh, a child might be born looking strange uh, was that um, that change was brought about by the mother's imagination. Uh, so there's an account of a lobster child born when his mother was frightened by a lobster in Leadenhall Market in, in, in London. <laughs> so kind of the, 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 the unborn matter uh, has been shaped. The thing then is you've got to wonder, well, wh who is active, right? Um, it's, it's, you know, is it the matter that's active or has something activated it by, by acting upon it? And I think 
whatever prepositions we use, I mean, each one can take us somewhere slightly different to talk about why a matter changes. Is it co And so I, the problematic I went into, you know, my materials looking for was matter spontaneously being active. <coughs> and, um, I kept finding these, these slightly sideways examples of things that activate matter. Um, I had a question for both of you, and thanks, thank you uh, both for your papers. Um, so, since we brought both of you together at the same session, obviously the question is, then your paper mainly deals uh, with Descartes and his gang, his friends, uh, dealing with questions in a very vertical, in inward manner, right? Dealing with God uh, and dealing with themselves in a very theoretical and inward-looking manner. To what extent... Outward looking, as uh, displayed or presented by Soroka, uh, has maybe affected their thinking and to what extent they are not really willing to be very frank about it. That is to say, to what extent the changing world around them is actually what driven the uh, ways, new ways of thinking about matter and the world and animated material or not. And Soroka, uh, along the same lines, to what extent this new imagination of the world is not just, in the end of the day, a self, uh, a process of, of self-determination of your place in the world. That is to say, in the end of the day, a form of inward looking, the way that Dan actually discussed in his paper. Uh, let, me, let me start. I mean, I, I hadn't thought of that question, but it's an excellent uh, thing to think about. Um, in the case of Descartes, I think his own experience was rather limited. Mm -hmm. And I think that he was uh, uh, not so interested in the, the um, he was not so interested in the exploration of what it is that people were learning. Um, the person who was interested in that was Francis Bacon. And Bacon was was um, just absolutely fascinated by all of the stuff that was coming in from the voyages of exploration. The um, uh, frontispiece of his Instauratio Magna, which was a major work published in 1620, which contained the, the, the Novo Organo, um, had a picture of a ship coming in from the, or going out, I think it's a little ambiguous, from the Pillars of Hercules. An obvious reference to, uh, you know, and he was all about exploration. He is, I think, the source for Cavendish's worldview, mm -hmm. and I think that I think that uh, um, that um, his his worldview is very much the same as Cavendish's, and I do wonder the extent to which it it may have been shaped by all of the. Um, unusual um, evidences that were coming in from the voyages of exploration that the world out there is not exactly the same as the world that uh, people have experienced in Europe. You, is this about this point? Yes, it is related, but please go ahead. I mean, I. Well, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, I had, I, I'll have to think about how it is that this world of competing, competing uh, appetites. Yeah that you can find in Bacon and then later in Cavendish right. uh, may, may have been. Negated by the So well, the entire process is actually a process of negation of that new world. Well, you know, they're in competition with one another. Yeah, really. yeah. Uh, you know, at the same time, they're in competition. And thank you. That's a, a great question. I would say absolutely the describing of others, you know, collecting and organizing of artifacts uh, was also a, a form of self-determination. One of the things I you know, doing with my kind of brand new project is is wondering how to use the, kind of the tools of, of anthropology and kind of turn them on 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 early modern Europeans. So um, I would say that early modern Europe is going through a process of ethnogenesis, by which I mean they're kind of rethinking their own identities and, and communities in response to to things and people coming in from outside. So, for example, for 
you know, Northern Europe, say, you know, Laos, Rome, or for or collectors in, in, in England, these people are not the direct inheritors of the civilization of Greece and Rome. They're also thinking about their own ancestors as closer to Tacitus, as, you know, wild, wild, wild German ancestors, uh, well, right, wild Germans, rather. So, um, when, you know, someone like, the 16th century English mathematician Thomas Harriet, or you know, people who read Harriet, looked at the uh, Virginia Algonquians, they would actually think about the, the Algonquians as showing you what Britain's Pictish forefathers looked like. Um, so when you have to put together you know, kind of artifacts from long ago and far away and close to home, potentially all of them idolatrous. So again, post-Reformation, you may be looking at desacralized you know, Catholic regalia alongside idols from Mexico uh, and uh, Rome. And by the 19th century, you have newly founded museums separating out art objects and anthropological ones and then you have this intertwined emergence of, of new forms of aesthetics and anthropology and yet um, and then there's a 73 French cabinet that was disassembled during the French Revolution with you know European <coughs> stuff going to places like the Bibliothèque Nationale, animals going to the Museum of Natural History and then even and nobody wanted the, the ethnographic stuff the stuff they call the sauvagerie <coughs> um, but then in the 19th century, this late, this late 19th century Polish anthropologist gave a 16th century Finnish, Finnish runic calendar to this collection of sauvagerie. So there's still this conceptual link between the wild kind of northern lands, which also had nasty climates, um, <laughs> and uh, sauvagerie. And you certainly get early modern travelers being anxious about even living in Britain. Mm -hmm. have time? <laughs> Let me, can, can I just have one, one little more thing? I was thinking about this. Um, Montaigne was very, very important. Everybody read Montaigne. Descartes read not Montaigne. Everybody later down. And Montaigne was certainly very, very interested in how it is that um, the discoveries of these um, new civilizations, these new peoples, um, um, affected how it is that Europeans should think about one another. Um, another um, thing that I might mention in this connection is Henry Moore uh, was very much um, uh, involved in questions about witchcraft and ghosts. And the empirical investigation, which was another very important, um, um, and people, were, people were wondering, do these things exist empirically? And what are the consequences of um, admitting them on our conception, for example, of you know the contents of the world matter? Fabio, well, I mean, my apologies, but um, to stay on track, we have to stop here and take our coffee break. And uh, our first speakers will return at three o'clock with a little bit of leeway.